Check, check. All right, all right, all right, guys. It's going to be a good day, one way or the other, okay? So um, today we're gonna cover public safety and the healthcare facility. And I've gotta to admit to you that it took a lot to bring me to the table right now today. So it, this is just one of those topics that's not that exciting. However, um, this is one of those things that once you understand NFPA 99 and a lot of the requirements of public safety, you're gonna be probably better outfitted for the, um, the next level of certification after the CBAT, which is the CHTM. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, I believe I'm looking forward to maybe doing what we did on anatomy physiology, which means we're going to start out with the documentation here, we'll see what they say. And then we will um, maybe tomorrow go into the cue cards because I'm seeing a little bit of a disparity here. All right, so this looks like a truncated amount of information. However, <laughs> look at the cue cards. That's, that's quite a few of the, uh, the cards. So I, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. All right, so let's go ahead. We'll, we'll uh, kick this party off. And um, guys, like I said, this isn't going to be the most exciting content out there. However, um, I like I said, I, I, I'm a 21 year biomed, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to have some sort of experience with most of this stuff anyway, all right? So let's go ahead and let's get started. Ah, here we go, here we go. All right, guys, I'll try and keep this up in frame. So uh, this particular study guide goes right into NFPA 99. NFPA 99, National Fire Protection Agency. Number 99 is the, um, it's, it's about healthcare facilities and electrical codes and stuff. Comes out every single three years. And the last one that I did a video on was 2021. And I have yet to do one on 2024. So, since I haven't even read 2024, because it's not publicly available, um, unfortunately, I, I don't know the latest NFPA 99. And the other unfortunate thing is I, I'm going back 20 years in knowledge from like way back in the early 2003, I think, um, was the first NFPA 99 I had to study. And there has been a lot of changes between then and now. It would be so much easier to cover this kind of material for you guys that only have a couple years under your belt. Why? Because they keep changing things. And that's a good thing because some of the changes are for the better. Some of the changes, they just um, took some of the terms and they made it more generic, which opens it to interpretation, which is usually not what you want from a, um, a regulation, but it is the way it is. So guys, um, I'm, I'm taking it that these are based on the 2021 because of when I bought these, I don't know if they would have updated to 2024. So let's start it right out. 
It's a uh, NFPA 99 policy on storage of gas cylinders. Okay, it says NFPA 99, section 11.3, defines standard for proper stowage of gas cylinders and containers. Now, uh, NFPA, I think it's 103, is about compressed gas systems in a medical facility. So, this should be interesting. The standard requires that full medical gas cylinders, as well as containers greater than 85 um, meters cubed, at a standard temperature and pressure, shall be stored separately from other containers and non-combustible lockers and storage spaces. Containers of non-flammable gas range from 8.5 meters to 85 meters shall be stored in secured non-combustible limited combustible space and oxidizing gases are required to be stored separately from any flammable gas, liquid, or vapor by a minimum of 20 feet. If the storage space is protected by NFPA 99 compliant automatic sprinklers, no additional separation of combined, um, if combined with a compliant gas cabinet. Section 11.3 also states that smoking and other sources of ignition are prohibited. <laughs> that kind of makes sense. However, separate enclosures are not required for cylinders being used for smoke compartments. Small A, B, D, and E cylinders must be secured to stand or other equipment designated to hold medical gas cylinders. Okay, so all of you, every single one of you, in fact, I could probably pull up a whole bunch of photos of cylinders thrown on the ground. It happens all the time. Combustible, non-combustible, oxidizing. So oxygen is an oxidizer. And I see those all the time thrown on the ground. It's saying that they have to be affixed to a stand, the, you know, the little trolley carts, or they have to be mounted to a piece of equipment, or they have to be in designated lockers. Now, this it's very wordy. Um, they're mentioning the capacity of the cylinder, so the 8.5 meters cubed and the 85 meters cubed, that's the relative capacity. Some cylinders are measured in like weight. These ones here are measured in um, gas capacity. All right, next. We're gonna get through this one kind of quickly, guys, because like I said, we're, we're gonna read through it, then maybe tomorrow, depending on how fast we get through this, we'll go through the, um, the flashcards. Flashcards, it's, it's a make or break. You know, either you know it or you don't, right? So, <laughs> and if it feels if it feels like I'm I'm especially tired today, that is because um, my uh, year and a half year old woke up at 4 a.m. screaming, absolutely screaming, um, looking for her sister, screaming, ask, and she was hitting and everything because she wanted to go check on her sister and make sure she was okay. The weirdest thing. Scared the hell out of me. I couldn't get back to sleep after that. So I've only got a few hours of sleep last night. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but we're going to press forward. Um, NFPA 99 requirements for electronic nurse call systems. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me just check this real quick. All right. All right. I'm making sure that you guys got the correct levels. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Hopefully. Uh, are you guys under an audit? Are we under an audit? What do you mean, um, you guys? Go ahead and tell me. I'll answer the question, but I, I just... Oh, Joint Commission. No, no, no. I'm, I'm part of an independent service organization. We have ISO certifications and audits, but not Joint Commission. No. That's for uh, CMMS, CMS uh, sponsored healthcare facilities. <laughs> NFPA 99 requirements for electronic nurse call systems. Nurse calls in accordance with NFPA 99 section 73311 are used to communicate with patients and staff via marked audiovisual and tone visual call systems. The systems must provide notifications for medical device alarms, staff emergency calls, code calls, and or staff or patient requests. The systems must also announce both audibly and visually each call made to relevant areas in accordance with state and local codes. The code 
allows such notifications to be additionally sent to staff via pagers and other wireless devices. There is some really interesting new tech coming out for nurse call systems that allow it to page to like on call cell phones and stuff. Some pretty cool stuff. We're going to get into some terminology next. Touch current. The NFPA code defines touch current as any leakage that passes from the chassis of a device which is able to be reached by patients or staff and flows through um, other than the device's protective grounding or another piece of the chassis. So anytime you touch a device, it's the amount of leakage that passes onto you. It's touch current. I guess that technically makes a lot of sense. I think they've called this different things. Obviously, they've called it leakage current, but touch current is the new modern and correct terminology. So, yeah, it used to be earth, earth leakage, then uh, chassis leakage, and now it's touch current. Clean agents. Clean agents are ex extinguishants, materials capable of extinguishing fires that are electrically non-conductive, volatile, or gaseous, and do not leave residues upon evaporation. Hmm. Inert gases, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and noble gases are clean agents. Okay, so inert gases, and the key is it can't leave a residue. So a lot of your uh, sodium bicarbonate fire extinguishers, they leave a residue, <laughs> and it's nasty, all right? Very cool. Telecommunications rooms. NFPA requires that healthcare facilities provide enough telecom telecommunications rooms, TRs, so that there's no more than 90 meters travel between data outlet and the TR. Jesus, I didn't know that. TRs must only use electrical equipment relevant to support the TRs, and only necessary mechanical equipment or fixtures may be inside. So inside a, a telecommunication room, only necessary things should be in there. How many comm rooms do you guys know where they're storing things? NFPA 99 says that is a no-go, and I guarantee you NFPA 101 is going to say almost the exact same because they define storage spaces and what can and can't be in there. It says there must be a minimum of one TR on every floor of a healthcare facility, and a single TR may service a maximum of 20,000 square feet on a floor. In disaster-prone areas, TRs must be interior rooms with no exterior facing walls. So what they want to make sure of is if there is some sort of defect in part of your facility, either fire or whatever, a telecommunications room is going to be able to maintain communications between one section of the facility and another. What they're saying is they don't want fibers from one central room running all over the damn place because if that one room shuts down, the whole entire campus is down. So that's good to know. I didn't know that, and it completely makes sense. Plug-connected, portable, non-medical electronics. Okay, guys, this is one where every hospital has a different policy. I get that. I understand that. However, let's see what NFPA 99 says about it. NFPA 99 requirements regarding AC-powered equipment not related to patient care, which include both facility and patient-owned electronics that the patient will touch during normal use, must be inspected by staff. Further, any improperly functioning equipment must be retired or reported to maintenance. NFPA 99 also provisions that household electronics without grounding may be permitted as long as they're not in the patient care vicinity unless they're double insulated. Well, a lot of radios and stuff out there are not double insulated and you'll find those in patient care areas. Every hospital has different policies. Um, when it comes down to inspections, notice it didn't really say anything about who, whose responsibility it is to inspect. In many facilities that I've been in, if a patient care item comes in and the patient owns it, then it's up to nursing staff to check it out and make sure it's safe, which means no defects in the cord, no obvious abrasions, and make sure that the prongs are secure and they're not broken off, and then it can be used in a patient care environment. Remember, if you touch it, you own it. So minimally invasive is what we're talking about for most inspections. Because if, if you break it, 
Well, then now you got to buy them a replacement. Requirements for medical gas and vacuum systems. Here we go. The standard applies to general anesthesia, deep sedation, that is, situations in which gas or vacuum leakage may cause major injury or death. And vacuum or and, and gas or vacuum systems for use within the patient care vicinity. It requires that gas cylinders adhere to DOT, TC, and ASME regulations, feature contents, specific outlet connections without adapters, be accurately labeled and unaltered, the contents verified before use, and stored properly and securely. Systems must incorporate appropriate piping and component redundancies to prevent single fault failure. Feature appropriate alarms, labeled shutoff valves, and pressure and vacuum indicators, and maintain an inventory and regular inspection by qualified individuals. That is quite the mouthful, guys, but what, what does it really say? Here, sorry, I'm going to shut my alarms off because my phone blows up all the time. So what it says is everything has to be labeled. You have zone valves, which you're going to find down corridors. Zone valves will shut off the whole entire section. Operating rooms usually have valves local to a specific room because you cannot shut off gases to more than one room. So it's going to be specific. Um, there's got to be, there's usually um, clear panels where you can see gauges. So it says they have to be labeled appropriately. So each gas has to be labeled and it has to have a gauge so that you can have a visual indicator of the status of your compressed gases. And down at the bottom, it says you have to maintain an inventory of it and you have to have regular inspections by qualified individuals. There are many ways that you guys can uh, inspect medical gases. There's usually contractors that come in and do it. They do it throughout the whole facility. And one of the things that you guys probably didn't know is that any booms that move around that have um, compressed gas hoses that run through them, those hoses have a life expectancy. If I remember correctly, it's like eight to 10 years and they have to be changed out. So those booms, they have to open them up and change out all the flex conduit that has uh, compressed gases. Most people don't do that. We've got booms out there that have been out there for 20 or so years and they have the same exact hoses. And that could be a problem. It could be, because you're, you're talking, what, 100 PSI in some of those? There we go. Okay. Hazardous material safety. Let's put this guy over here. Hazardous material safety. All right, uh, Mr. Justin. All right, guys. When it comes to the materials, I'm telling you, I've got them, and I've got them here, and I've got them here. You have to remember that these materials, they are copyrighted, right? Just telling you, copyrighted materials, I can't openly give them to you. However, I can tell you that I'm pretty sure I've seen a link online that allows you to download them from a shared folder. And I might be able to get you that link so that you can publicly download them anonymously. Just saying. Hazard communication versus globally harmonized system. Holy cow, what the heck? Come on. What is this? All right, hazard communication versus globally harmonized system. What are they even talking about? Refers to Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, standard governs the requirements to notify workers of chemical hazards faced at work to provide information on protection of hazards, GHS, refers to an international standard developed by the United Nations to guide hazardous chemical labeling, warning systems, and safety data sheets. So we used to have uh, material safety data sheets, MSDS. Now I believe they just call them safety data sheets. Why? Because people are justifying their job by switching names. I don't know. It's crazy. But like I said in the beginning, you've been doing this for like 20 or plus years. You're going to be irritated by the fact that they keep changing some of these nomenclatures. So, All right. It says the GHS has developed a standard to standard has developed to standardize hazard warning, 
terminology, pictograms, and safety data sheets worldwide so that international commerce could be improved and language barriers overcome. The OSHA hazard communication standard has recently updated to include the requirements of the GHS. As of 2015, all workplaces in the United States are required to have safety data sheets available on site to inform the, uh, to conform to the GHS system and uh, to use these in their notification training programs. Okay, well, I guess so. Let's learn about the safety data sheets. You guys should know about this. Just to let you know, many, many larger medical facilities are bought into a digital version of a material safety data sheet or safety data sheet. And uh, that means that they're all available online. You have to like scan some cute little code and you magically have access. However, if you're a smaller facility or if you are not in the continental United States, there's a good chance that you have to maintain a MSDS or safety data sheet binder, which means any chemical that comes into a medical facility, you have to have in this fantastic binder. Many people um, have the binders with the, uh, the housekeeping staff, usually EVS. And you know, Biomed obviously has their own material safety data sheet. There's also safety data sheets for like up in nuclear medicine because they have um, you know, <laughs> radioactive isotopes and stuff. And obviously you're not gonna have the MSDS for that down in your shop. So locally, there, there's also uh, local policies for uh, safety data sheets. But anyway, let's learn about them. Safety data sheets, formerly material safety data sheets, Provide information on the physical and chemical properties of the substance as well as potential health and environmental concerns. OSHA requires that all chemicals be labeled appropriately and the SDSs be readily available in the workplace. The hazard communication standard also requires employees to be trained on by the employer to maintain the records and training given. The format for SDSs includes 16 sections. Identification, hold on, let's, let's pull these up. All right, let's, let's pull up an image so that you guys can see what a material safety data sheet looks like. Open image in new tab. Boop, boop. Okay, here we go. Here's a material safety data sheet for ethanol. So um, they have a, a 16 different sections. The identification, section one. Section two is hazard identification, which uh, you can see, oh, right here hazardous components. So here we only have three sections, right? Um, composition information on ingredients. Section four is first aid. Section five is firefighting. Section six is accidental release measures. Section seven is handling and storage requirements. This demo that I pulled up is not compliant because it does not have all that. Let's load another one. Okay, well here you can see section one, section two, and it progresses down. Some uh, safety data sheets are incredibly small because sometimes it's a very simple product. Um, section eight, physical chemical properties. Section nine, exposure controls and personnel protection. 10, stability and reactivity, kind of an important one. Uh, 11, toxicology information. 12, eco ecological information. 13, disposal considerations. 14, transport information. 15 is regulatory information. And 16 is other information. So, um, just to let you know, I have been inspected many, many times throughout my career. And... I have been hit on the safety data sheets multiple times. And sometimes it's absolutely stupid. One of them was, the heck was it? It was a natural product. I don't think it was a lubricant. Maybe it was a lubricant. But anyway, it was in my shop and the inspector came in and said, he pointed at something and said, I want to see the material safety data sheet on this right here. 
and maybe it was a flux. It might have been a natural flux because some fluxes are, are plant-based and are natural. And um, it seems like that's what it was. And they wanted to see the safety data sheet on it. And right on the outside, it's, it says that it's, it's uh, non-toxic. Right on the outside of the container. And it technically, in, in the warnings on the back, it says they wouldn't suggest eating, but it is safe to ingest. And <laughs> so the inspector, being one of those kind of dicks that doesn't like being uh, told he's wrong... I told them it's non-toxic. It says right on it, and it says that it's, it's not recommended to ingest it. It says right on the bottle, and he says, would you eat it? And I said, that's not the, that's not the matter of point. The matter of point is it's non-toxic. So why would you write somebody up for not having a safety data sheet on it? Some people are just like that, man. <sighs> Some people, when they have too much power. Okay. Let's get back to it. All right, describing toxicity and exposure limits for hazardous substances. This is a pretty important one. SDS provides a number of indicators for possible health threats on particular chemicals. They're required to provide all known information regarding uh, carcinology or <laughs> carcinogenicity, car carcinogenicity, its ability to cause cancer. Jeez. Um, Carcinogenic risks are published in the National Toxicology Program Report, the NTP, the International Agency on Research and Cancer, and Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. Or you can look for any stickers that say, hey, this product causes cancer in California. We've all seen those ones. Toxic toxicity levels are indicated by numbers called the LD50 and the LC50. LD50 refers to the dose at which 50% of the test subjects were killed. Oh. LC50 is the lethal concentration at which 50% of the test subjects were killed. Okay. So the LD is the dose at which 50% of the test subjects died. And the LC is the lethal concentration at which 50% of the test subjects were, were killed. Doses are typically normalized to include mass of the possible toxin provided by the mass of the sub. Anyway, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. You guys get it. There's, there's a bunch of stats that they give. Limits for exposure to a particular chemical are also provided. They can be measured as the OSHA permissible exposure limit, PEL, and or the threshold limit values, the TLV. I hope that's not on the test. Come on, guys. Come on. Types of personal safety equipment. This is a good one. There's probably going to be questions about personal protection equipment, PPE. SDSs all often recommend the usage of chemical protective clothing, CPC, protective eye goggles with splash guards and, and air vents should be used when handling chemicals. Face shields should also be used when working with large quantities of, of substance and are most effective when used in conjunction with safety glasses. In the mode of possible hazard is through contact and or absorption through the skin, appropriate gloves should be worn. Gloves are chosen based on their permeability to and reactivity with the chemical in use. Personal respiratory equipment may be indicated if fume hoods are not provided, adequate ventilation or fumes of airborne particulates. Body protection depends on the level of protection needed and the ranges from rubberized aprons to full suits that are evaluated for their permeability and leak protection. Closed toe protective shoes should always be worn when working with chemicals. Right? Label requirements for chemicals. The term label under the JHS refers to label on the container. Under JHS, it's required to contain certain elements those requirements apply to whether the label is affixed by the manufacturer or where the chemical is placed into a smaller secondary container in the workplace. Now, this one is an important one because people get burned by that. Let's say you dilute something and you put it in a spray bottle. Well, that spray bottle has to have the dilution and it has to have the same chemical uh, labeling saying what's in the bottle. You can't just write on it that it's alcohol or ethanol. You can't do that. You have to have the actual label on the outside of the bottle. 
That label usually has a QR code. You can scan it usually pretty quickly and pull up the safety data sheet on that chemical. It says the label must include identification of the chemical, the manufacturer's name and contact info, and the appropriate GHS pictograms, uh, which are, you know, corrosive, um, stuff like that, you know. And the applicable signal words, either danger or warning, as applicable. And precautionary statements, measures to reduce risk from exposure to that chemical. And it goes down into some of those symbols. Look at that, right there. It says the pictograms used in the GHS are simple pictures used to convey hazards posed by the chemical. They're meant to be universally understandable by people with diverse language and reading fluencies. They are as follows. Health hazard, you're gonna die. Flammable, sensitizer or irritant, interesting. Gas under pressure, oxidizer, corrosive, poison, we know that one. Environmental hazard, and that's the, the dead fish. And reactive, ooh, that's a scary one. Every time I see that one. Signal words. Under the GHS Hazard Communication and Safety Data Sheet System, the term signal word is used to describe one word that summarizes the degree of danger posed by the substances. There are only two signal words, danger and warning. The word danger is used when more hazardous substances that present immediate hazards, such as flammability, reactivity, poison, and so on. The word warning is used for lesser hazards, such as irritants, environmental hazards, and less toxic substances. Hmm. Kind of makes you feel good about it. The signal word used on the label to provide a quick and easy, understandable indication of the degree of hazard posed by the substance. All right. We're going into infections, guys. Let's see. Um, hmm. Would it help if I pulled up this one? Let's pull up this one and let's see what we got. Okay. Um, well, this is the 2012 format with the other symbols that used to be on there. And you clearly just seen the new symbols again. One of those things I'm talking about, things change and you have to stay up on it. So even though I studied this stuff 21 years ago, obviously things have changed. The symbols are even different. Crazy. All right, protective equipment for preventing infection. Mind you guys, I do have my, my uh, screen over here and I can pop over there and I can, I can read questions. If any of this it's a little confusing. I will pull up supplementary information for y'all and uh, we'll go over it together because I probably have the same question. Okay, let's see. Protective equipment for preventing infection. Personal protective equipment, PPE, is specialized clothing and equipment that may be worn in patient care areas that present a risk of infection. These commonly include gloves, gowns, aprons, and masks, as well as face shields and respirators. Gloves protect the hands and wrists. Gowns and aprons protect clothing and the skin. Masks and respirators filter particles of various sizes and prevent them from entering the mouth and nose. Face shields provide an impenetrable barrier in front of the eyes, nose, and mouth where there's a risk of infectious material splashing or spraying. So, electrical shock hazards. Right. Electrical shock hazards. Electrical shock can occur when electrical conductors are exposed due to damage or short causing excessive leakage current through equipment chassis. Currents between 100 and 200 milliamp years, even at relatively low voltages, can cause ventricular fibrillation. Now, while it's possible, there are many experts in our industry that say that it is incredibly unlikely and it has never really been proven. All right? It's never really been proven uh, that this happens. But liability, right? Interesting. 
a lethal arrhythmia in which ventricles of the heart contract asynchronously. asynchronously. <laughs> All staff should be able to recognize and report shock hazards and offending devices should be removed from service. In the event of an electrical shock, avoid touching or moving the victim. The electrical source should be disconnected at the fuse box or circuit breaker or should be moved away from the victim with non-conductive materials like a wooden pole or a plastic pole. First aid procedures should include checking for breathing in a pulse, starting cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, if necessary, and calling emergency services. Now, what they didn't say here is that the equipment and everything should be quarantined. They never say that, do they? <laughs> radiation protective equipment. Personal protective equipment for radiation protection includes lead shielding clothing, such as lead aprons, collars, gloves, and eyewear, radiation exposure, and medical settings pr primarily comes from radiology, x-rays, fluoroscopy, CTs. NFPA 99 standards require labeling of spaces that present a radiation risk. Excess radiation exposure from medical devices must be avoidable where possible so that rooms for x-ray imaging are also shielded to prevent leakage to staff and patients outside. Now, one of the things they do not talk about here is the necessity for periodic inspections of the lead aprons and protective gear. It's actually a, I don't know, that's, I see that as a very big missed opportunity because aprons, it's, it's very thin lead and what happens is that if it's not taken care of properly, it's not hung up properly, then the lead folds and lead, like any metal, it can work harden and it creates cracks. And anytime you have cracks, you know, is a hole in the barrier and x-rays, which penetrate, they will go right through that crack or weak spot and they penetrate the body. So, um, I wonder if they're also going to talk about Hmm. They're not they didn't mention badges. The TLDE badges. Dustimeters. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Another missed opportunity. I, I see this this manual lacking. They should talk about dosimeters. They should talk about TLDE badges and inspecting PPE regularly. Huh. Okay. All right. Well that's radiation protective equipment. Next, so to let you guys know, all right, let's go ahead and switch this over so that you guys can see exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, these right here are very typical aprons, so it depends on the type of, of procedure, and it also depends on if you're male or female, believe it or not. And notice this little guy up here in the corner, and this guy right here, that is to wrap around your neck. And uh, you can see these guys right here are doing it correctly. Now why do you suppose they have gowns that are wrapped up here around your neck? Well, if you remember yesterday's uh, live stream where we talked about anatomy physiology, that is where you guys have a series of glands and those glands are susceptible to radiation. You know, if you're covering just your torso, that's fine, but these glands right here, um, if there's any cancerous cells or damaged cells, they can transport themselves throughout your lymph system really quickly, and cancer can spread throughout your body incredibly quickly, which is why they're blocking all this as much as possible. Now, I, I believe this, the, the system used to be called ALARA, as low as reasonably acceptable. I, I believe that's what they used to call it, Alara. And that means always, you know, even though you have shielding, we always try to minimize um, any uh, exposure whatsoever when possible. So, hmm. okay, anyway, let's continue. So we have pathogen control and safety. All right here, let me see if I can maintain a center. And I, I, I'll try not to move this around. I, when I read books and stuff, I move papers around. It's just how I am. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Universal precautions for pathogen control and safety. 
Universal precautions is a term used in control of occupational exposure to bloodborne pathogens. The premise is that any and all blood and bodily fluids are potentially contaminated, and probably are if they're in a facility, with bloodborne pathogens such as human <laughs> HIV, human immunodeficiency. I can't talk today. <laughs> immunodeficiency virus or hepatitis, and therefore should be treated as such. I mean, people wouldn't be in the hospital if they weren't sick anyway, right? The universal precautions are to be employed. The universal precautions to be employed are to wear proper protective equipment when handling those items, gloves and eye protection, and ensure that all surfaces contaminated with blood are properly cleaned with bleach solution to kill any viruses that might be present. Solid waste contaminated with blood must be contained in a plastic bag to prevent any exposure to those that may be handling it. So, um, I have actually had this uh, conversation with nurses before is um, any and all items that are contaminated are to be treated like it's the worst of the worst. Assume every single bit of blood and bodily fluid is contaminated with HIV. Um, it's just what we have to do, right? Because you don't know, and they don't know. Well, I've had this out with nurses because I've had them deliver things to Biomed, many of you have too, that is covered in blood. So let's say foot controls from surgical. Nothing is ever to leave an operating room that's contaminated, ever. And if it does leave the operating room, it has to be encased inside something and transported to where it can be cleaned. Only once it's been cleaned should it ever come to Biomed. Why? I don't know if you guys have noticed, but Biomeds can completely possibly contaminate the entire facility. There's not a single job in a medical facility that can walk between departments like Biomed does. There's not a single one. You can go from the ER into an operating room, you can go into labor and delivery, and then you can go into admin offices. Biomeds go absolutely everywhere. EVS, none of those guys. They usually stay kind of regionalized and sectionalized according to their specialty. Biomeds, we go everywhere. We'll go into ICUs, we go into ORs. I'm a big, big proponent of washing my hands, which is why I have no jewelry on or anything. I wash my hands constantly. And that is because there's some very nasty stuff out there, guys. But just remember, nothing should ever be out in the hallways or corridors that is contaminated, all right? And assume all bodily fluids are contaminated because they probably are. Bloodborne pathogens. Bloodborne pathogens are disease-causing agents that can be transmitted from one, one person to another by contact with blood or bodily fluids of a person who is infected. We've all seen zombie movies, guys. <laughs> Examples of bloodborne pathogens include hepatitis, ugh, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, and Ebola. Ugh. Employees may be at risk of infection by bloodborne pathogens while administering first aid or during an injury situation. Very true. They are always a concern because the diseases that are transmitted by contact with blood or bodily fluid are serious and severe and sometimes have fatal consequences. In addition, they do not have successful cures available. Many of them don't. You live with it, unfortunately. So if one becomes infected, it will affect the person for the rest of their lives. Now, I have known many, many people that have gotten needle sticks. That's why I don't stick my hands under any medical equipment when I'm picking it up because I have had needles stick my gloves, but thankfully not my hands. And uh, I've known many other biomeds that have gotten needle sticks. Be careful out there, guys. Seriously. Disposing of first aid materials contaminated with blood. During the course of administering first aid, an employer will likely generate waste materials contaminated with blood. The bloodborne pathogen standard defines regulated waste as that which is contaminated with blood that is liquid or free-flowing. This regulated waste must be closed and contained to prevent potential contamination and exposure that should be disposed of through a licensed medical waste company. However, if there are small amounts of blood on first aid materials such as gauze, band-aids, or wound dressings that, that do not contain free-flowing blood, in other words, it's dried, these items can be placed in a plastic bag and then placed in the regular trash and disposed of with regular solid waste. Good to know. Um, that, that would be an interesting one to argue out because if, if there's no blood, if it's just like 
dried blood or blood residue, then it doesn't have to be um, treated as a hazardous waste. You just bag it and it says you can throw it right in the trash with the regular waste. That's what it says. Basic, <clears throat> excuse me guys. <laughs> Basic infection control measures. All right, I'm down here guys. Standard infection control measures are designed to prevent transmission of microbial substances between patients and or medical providers. These measures are indicated for everyone and include frequent hand washing, wearing gloves whenever bodily fluids are involved, and wearing face shields and gowns when splashes are anticipated. For those advanced, for more advanced control with tuberculosis, secure, severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, another nasty one, or uh, vesicular rash disorder such as VZ8, uh, VZV. Now, okay, so I'm an absolute nerd, guys. So I know what SARS is. That's nasty stuff. I do my own research all the time, and if I see something that I don't know, I have to look it up. So my, a couple of my last videos were demonetized because I was showing um, anatomy <laughs> on the video. Go figure, um, of course. Let's see, it is called. B, come on. B E S I C. There it is. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Well, guys, that's why we're doing this study group. If there's something that I am unaware of, I'm going to pull it up, and we're going to go over this together. Um, okay. That looks like some nasty stuff. Oh, man. What's crazy is, is it looks like it's on kids and old people. That's an interesting one. Do you see some of these? A lot of these are kids, kid, kid. Old people. Looks like an older person. Ah, oh, I wonder why, right? Okay. So I always try to stay up on this stuff when I see it. And that's one I didn't know of. Interesting. Okay. Um, Vesicular rash disorders, which you're seeing here, airborne precautions should be instituted to prevent the spread of tiny droplets that can remain suspended in the air for days and travel throughout the hospital environment. Therefore, negative pressure rooms are essential and providers and patients should wear high efficiency N95 masks and be fitted in advance. For disorders such as influenza and other infections spread by respiratory droplets, spread by cough or sneeze, basic surgical masks should be worn, for precautions in the presence of diseases transmitted fecally, orally, gowns and gloves should be used and contacted, uh, used with contact limited. Hold on. <laughs> for precautions in the presence of diseases transmitted fecal, orally, gowns and gloves should be used and contact is limited. Laboratory coats are not a substitute for proper gowning. Why? Because they're porous. <laughs> patient care areas need to be cleaned daily. Any patient who appears to have communicable disease or is immunosuppressed should be taken to an exam room as soon as possible. Policies should be in place for cleaning exam rooms and equipment between patients and at the end of... Oh, 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 hold on. At the end of the day. All right. Boop, boop. There we go. There should be a clean and dirty utility room so that the contaminated equipment or supplies are not mixed with clean supplies. There's always dirty rooms. And unfortunately, that is where we always find medical equipment. In the dirty room. Why? Out of sight, out of mind. They push it in there. If it's in the dirty room, it's dirty. Okay? Even if they said they wiped it down, do not believe them. Do not believe them. And what they do... So they remove it from an infectious environment and they throw it in the dirty room and that's where that shit sits, okay? It sits there and it's absolutely disgusting, 
All right, and that means power cords and everything. It all has to be wiped down. If you can't tell, if there's one thing that I'm an absolute prick about, guys, it's cleanliness. Because hospitals, the number one, the damaging thing for hospitals is that the score for the hospital and everything depends on the infection rate of the hospital, right? And obviously patient, patient um, scores. However, the infection rates are just, it's insane. You read some of the reviews on some of these hospitals and the infection rates are public. It's public information. You can see which ones have a garbage system and which ones do not. <sighs> There's a lot of public information out there, guys. It says the proper disposal of needles and sharps need to be in appropriate containers. Hand washing supplies should be readily available and all staff should recognize health exposure risks and the presence of bacteria in the work environment. All employees need to understand the process of disease transmission and the use of standard precautions and how to isolate an infected patient and employee safety. Okay. Without going any further, interesting enough, when you, when you talk about standard precautions, we are almost always talking about the signs that will hang outside um, the door of a patient that give you the standard precautions like droplet precaution, um, et cetera. It's amazing that we just talked about it. I don't know, maybe, maybe they'll cover it further down, but they didn't mention signage. Interesting. So when a room's clean, the signage has to be changed as well. If there's a sign on a door, even if they said they just cleaned the room, assume the room's dirty, okay? So if they have droplet precautions on there and they, you have to gun up and stuff and they say, oh, we just cleaned that room, you can go in. If that sign is still up, do not believe them. Gown up, go in anyway. Because if you can't tell, I don't believe anybody anymore. And yeah, I'm a little bit cynical, but that's because humans take the path of least resistance, which means they will usually lie, or even if they don't know the correct information, they'll usually say the path of least resistance, which is, well, it's already been done. And it's too easy to prove that it hasn't, right? So just remember that. Always assume that everything's dirty. Office procedures. Each medical facility should carry out biological risk assessment each year and when new risks arise to determine the biosafety level. Agent hazards and procedure hazards. Work practices should conform to bloodborne pathogen standard from the OSHA and standard precautions from the CDC and infection control precautions can include the following. Utilizing appropriate hand hygiene with a hands-free sink for washing hands available near the entrance or exits. I love these sinks. The ones that require the foot pedal, you know, kind of like scrub sinks. I love those. Or the ones that have the um, auto dispenser that have the infrared, so you shove your hands down there and they, they can detect, they turn the water on. Oh my gosh, there is nothing worse than having some sort of garbage on your hands that you don't know and you have to go up and turn on the faucet because now you just contaminated your faucet. I absolutely love no hand sinks. Love it. Using mechanical pipettes instead of mouth pipetting? Who the, who the hell does mouth pipetting? What the heck? This is some old head uh, baby boomer stuff. Who, who does mouth pipetting? All right, whatever. Prohibiting eating, drinking, smoking, storing food, applying makeup, or handling contact lenses in the laboratory. Maintaining safe handling of sharps policies, utilizing retractable needles and lances. That's a cool new technology development. Minimizing splashing and aerosoling liquids. Decontaminating potentially infectious materials prior to disposable. Packaging potentially infectious materials for disposal outside the facility in appropriate packaging according to regulations. That's usually the red bags that are bio waste. Maintaining a pest management program. That's a pretty good one. Ensuring that all personnel are adequately trained. It's an annual core competency. Everybody in a medical facility has to be trained on things like bloodborne pathogen and for good reason. Ensuring appropriate immunizations and screen for personnel. Making, uh, making personal protective equipment available and monitoring appropriate use. Ensuring an IWAS station is easily assessed and available. 
So the eyewash station is one of those things that always gets me um, because within proximity of your work environment, especially you biomeds, you should have a hand wash station and you need to have an eye wash station, all right? Stuff happens, stuff splashes up in the eyes all the times or maybe you got an eye itch and you inadvertently touched your eye. It does happen, guys. Trust me, I eat spicy foods and I touch my eyes on accident all the time. It's just a human reaction. Like we just rub our eyes and, you know, I just got through cutting some habanero peppers or something and, you know, the next 10 minutes of my life is miserable. It does happen and it happens in the work environment too. So if you guys don't have um, like a lockout tag out system, which we might talk about, or if you don't have um, an eye wash station and um, first aid kit, I really recommend you get all three of those things. CDC standard precautions. The CDC standard precautions are a set of infection control guidelines with a broader scope than the infection control of the universal precautions of the 1980s. Hmm, don't remember those. Standard precautions were published by the CDC in 1996 to incorporate the main elements of universal precautions along with body substance isolation to provide a set of precautions more applicable to healthcare environments. Standard precautions apply to bodily fluids and other body and blood contaminated fluids but do not include precautions for contact, droplet, and airborne modes of transportation. When, standards, when standard precautions do not provide sufficient protection, transmission-based precautions are recommended as supplementary measures. What does that mean? It means that there's two different policies out there and you gotta take a guess at which one you're gonna use. Fantastic. All right, biohazardous waste and disposal methods. Hazardous wastes include liquid waste, soft materials, and sharps. Liquid wastes include bodily fluids such as saliva, blood, and urine. Biohazardous spills should be called to the attention of staff and staff trained in using correct procedures and tools. Hazardous soft materials include those that absorb and become contaminated with liquid waste, such as patient bedding, bandages, and towels. <sighs> you guys, if you have any sort of uh, mats on your stretchers, on your hospital beds, or let's say surgical tables, even if you have torn uh, plastic on your wheelchairs, you will get hammered for infection control. It's such an easy thing for inspectors to find, and it's so easy for you to find before you get inspected, but yet here we are, and people still have these problems where they have cuts, they have old bedding, all sorts of stuff, and it's an infection control hazard. Like you should have no exposed foam on any medical device, all right? These materials can be disposed of in leak-proof bags to be cleaned and disposed of by specialized facilities. Sharps, including needles and scalpels, which can punch your skin and become contaminated with blood, as well as sharp debris, such as broken glass and metal or plastic shards. Procedure for sharps is to deposit them in labeled sharps containers to be collected and disposed of by medical waste services. All right, there's a lot of good information in there. A lot of us are very familiar with that. And I am on my last sheet for the day, guys. I am gonna save, so I always like reading material and then coming back the next day and trying to figure out how much I remember because that tells me exactly how, how successful my, my studying is. If I don't remember, then I need to go back through it, maybe in some detail. All right, so let's do it. <laughs> Old school lab text did mouth pipetting. <laughs> All right, healthcare standards. Let's get into it. The big one, Joint Commission, JCO. The Joint Commission, formerly called the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, or JCO, is a national not for profit organization that accredits and certifies more than 20,000 national and international healthcare programs and organizations through peer reviews. We all have our opinions on this one, guys, all right? Trust me. I've dealt with Joint Commission many times, and I have seen some absolute garbage. I've seen some good inspectors, too, but a lot of it's garbage. So if I tell you guys, like, hey, by the way, no exposed blood, make sure that there's no cut fabric on your medical equipment and stuff, that's because that's easy. It's low-hanging fruit for these inspectors. These are the inspectors. 
Its mission is to improve patient safety and quality of care. The Joint Commission sets standards for accreditation and competencies for healthcare workers, especially regarding infection control, continuing education, visiting rules, patient rights, background checks, staffing levels, medical records, and ventilation. Those are pretty good. <clears throat> the Joint Commission issues its National Patient Safety Goals annually under advisement of national experts from the American College of Physicians, the American Hospital Association, and the American College of Sur Surgeons. The Joint Commission requires quality management and risk management to be linked. The Joint Commission has established core measurements to determine if healthcare institutions comply with current standards, and it makes the results of accreditation service public. So you can see how successful hospitals are because it is public information. So you're paying them a hell of a lot of money, hell of a lot of money to come in and inspect your organization, and uh, then its findings become public. Now, why, why do we have these organizations? Well, it all comes down to money. That's that's really what it is. So, um, in order to obtain CMS money, um, that is federal government money, which most hospitals would fail if they did not get payments from the federal government. Technically, the American healthcare is subsidized by the federal government. If hospitals didn't get that CMS money, they might as well close their doors. And that is why the Joint Commission, DNV, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is so important. And we're going we're gonna to talk about some of that coming up. But just to let you know, you need to know who these entities are, and not just for this, also for the CHTM exam coming, coming forward, all right? Accreditation certification and recognition options. Interesting. Okay, so I don't know why they did this. Joint Commission should have been down here, and accreditation certification and recognition options should have been up here. All right? Like, this is an option. DNV is an option. You get to choose which one you want. So, um,. I'm a little confused why they say like, oh, this is the main one and then here are your other options. No, it sh they should all be together. DNV is gaining in market share. DNV is an accreditation organization that accredits hospitals, critical access hospitals, ancillary services such as home health, hospitals, hospice, durable medical equipment, prosthetics, or orth orthotics, orthotics, I have never heard that word before orthotics, and supplies, pharmacy, and prime, private duty. DNV GL also provides a number of certificates, including managing infection risk, primary stroke center, comprehensive stroke center, acute stroke ready, hip and knee replacement. DNV GL, GL utilizes national integration accreditation for healthcare requirements and incorporates centers for medical and Medicaid services, conditions of participation with ISO 9001, quality management program, I know I'm reading this like they're, they're joint sentences. Sorry, guys. Surveys are conducted annually. Partially true, partially not true, okay? We'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. The ISO, International uh, Organization for Standardization, publishes international results. ISO 9000 includes standards for quality management and promotes a process approach utilizing the Plan, Do, Check, Act, PDCA cycle Plan, do, check, act, cycle, and risk-based thinking. Standards are published for use by an organization. ISO 9001 establishes necessary criteria for quality management with a focus on quality management principles, customer focus, leadership, engagement of people, process approach, and evidence-based decision-making and relationship management. I have not studied on very many of those. So <clears throat> they kind of skipped over it. DNV, that is not necessarily accurate about the annual inspections. Reason being is DNV themselves does not audit you annually. There is, I, I think I did a whole video on DNV, and I believe DNV comes into your facility and does a major audit every three years, I believe. It's every two or three years, and uh, maybe it's every two years. And in the off year, you're supposed to do an internal audit and a small investigation. So DNV is based on ISO certification. 
In other words, you have to have a quality management program and an internal quality, quality assurance program. There you go. So uh, that means that you have to have your own team of people on site that will inspect random departments of the hospital. And in my opinion, DNV has some real pluses. And uh, Joint Commission, it's every three years, I believe, is when they come through. And for Joint Commission, right after they leave, a lot of people just booger off and don't do what they're supposed to. And then, like, a couple months before Joint Commission shows up, everybody's running around like crazy. Oh, my gosh, the world's on fire. And they're trying to implement processes and stuff because Joint Commission is going to show up soon. But this is stuff they should have been doing the whole time. But here's the difference. DNV, because you have a quality uh, management program yourself, um, you have your own investigator inside and your own ISO program. You basically write the ISO program and they judge you based on your own program. It's really fascinating stuff, guys. I did a whole video on DNV. Go check it out. But uh, I don't like that they say surveys are conducted annually because it's not descript enough. Yes, annually they do happen, but who's doing them? And which ones are the major ones? Which ones are the minor ones? Those do matter. So it's not like they're coming in and they're just pounding cement every year. That's not how it is. Anyway, um, let's go. Centers for, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. I talked about those earlier, guys. Previously known as the Healthcare Financing Administration, the HCFA, we see HCFA all over the place. Now it's called CMS. Why? Reasons. Uh, it's a federal agency that runs Medicare and Medicaid programs, providing benefits to more than 75 million Americans. It also covers Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP. CMS also has a responsibility to regulate laboratory testing on humans. And, along with the Departments of Labor and Treasury, assists in maintaining health insurance coverage for small companies and individuals and eliminating discrimination based on health status for people purchasing health insurance. CMS combats fraud and abuse in cooperation with federal departments and state and local governments. CMS helps improve the quality of health care for people receiving health coverage via its programs, though development, enforcement of standards, measurements, and improving outcomes of care and education health... Oh, jeez. Hold on. They love their run-on sentences. Hold on, hold on. CMS helps improve the quality of health care for people receiving health coverage via its programs through development and enforcement of standards, measuring and improving outcomes of care, and educating health care providers and beneficiaries. There we go. I can read it correctly. Core measures. Core measures are the evidence-based use of treatments to reduce the risk of complications. The CMS publishes core sets, groups of core measures, of clinical quality measures, CQMs, each year. Now, I'm pretty sure, although I haven't taken the uh, CHTM exam, this stuff is going to be hit hard. It's going to be hit really hard. The CQMs, um, when you're talking about patient uh, metrics and stuff, it's probably going to be hit really hard, man. So, um, interesting information. I just don't think they give enough detail. All right, last part of the last page, guys. As of 2014, CMS does not require submission of core sets data, but recommends that healthcare practitioners report data for one adult core set and one pediatric core set. Adult. Core of hypertension use of high-risk medications in the elderly, tobacco preventive care, and screening, imaging for lower back pain, preventive care and screening for depression, documentation of current medications, body mass index, preventive care and screening, referral reports, and functional status assessment for complex chronic conditions. Wow, that's a, that's a mouthful, guys. I'm pretty sure we're not going to have to remember that. You should remember that they, they submit for at least one case for adult and pediatric. That's probably, at best, what's on the test. <clears throat> pediatric. Pharyngitis testing, weight assessment and counseling, nutrition and physical activity, uh, chlamydia screening, interesting, uh, appropriate asthma, asthma treatment, childhood immunizations, treatment for upper respiratory infections, attention deficit, Attention 
deficient hyperactivity disorder, geez, ah, ADHD, follow-up preventive care and screening for depression, ages 12 and older, and dental assessment, decay and cavities. Hmm, that's interesting. All right. The College of American Pathologists, CAP, CAP inspections. Now, if any of you have been around laboratories, you have heard of CAP inspections, okay? CAP, um, they hit laboratories and they hit them hard. I consider CAP inspections some of the most thorough inspections that healthcare facilities ever receive. Why? Because CAP inspections directly inspect medical equipment. Now, they do like tracers and stuff with, um, with DNV and with Joint Commission. But they don't go into detail like CAP. CAP does not play around, all right? And that's the College of American Pathologists. The CAP is a non-for-profit organization that serves as the primary accrediting agencies for medical and hospital laboratories under the authority of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. CAP conducts regular, every two years, and spontaneous inspections for laboratories. That's why you have to make sure your stuff is always documented. <laughs> Make sure your stuff is thoroughly documented in laboratories. Guaranteed. CAP inspections usually include touring the facilities, interviewing staff, reviewing procedures for quality control, sample handling, and reviewing facility records. And I like that they left this off on another important one that doesn't get talked about very much, the Safe Medical Devices Act. The SMDA. We had to study on this hard back in the day. So the SMDA functions as an extension of the FDA's medical device reporting regulations. The act designates reporting requirements to track adverse events related to medical devices and what was amended in 1992 to require additional information in medical device reports. This includes reporting any deaths related to a medical device booth to a medical device. Oh, hold on, hold on. This includes reporting any deaths related to a medical device and both the FDA and the manufacturer and any serious injuries to the manufacturer, otherwise to the FDA. So you have to report it to the FDA and the manufacturer when there is an incident. How many people do that? Not too many, right? And requires annual summaries of submitted reports. Although the reports mainly come from manufacturers, medical device reports are also required and come from device user facilities, healthcare providers, when applicable. The thing is, is a lot of people think of reporting things to the Safe Medical Device Act, uh, the FDA, and the manufacturer. They think it opens them up for culpability or liability. And a lot of people, pathologies resistance, choose not to do it. There are patient incidents all over the place. Patient incidents happen all the time. How many people report through the Safe Medical Device Act? And I don't know if it's really applicable, but the Safe Medical Device Act also talks about tracking specific medical devices. Hmm. They didn't go into that on this one. Interesting. Wow. Anyway, guys, I believe I've taken enough of your time. So that puts us at just over an hour. This is like my perfect study time, all right? So just over an hour, we covered a lot of material. A lot of it was covered in a generic form. So maybe not as much detail as maybe I would have preferred, but maybe it's not testable, okay? So maybe you don't have to go into that. However, public safety and healthcare facilities, if you're gonna take the CHTM in the future, if there's anything that I talked about today that you do not completely understand, I highly suggest you look it up. Do your research, right? Now, I will do my research tonight, and I'll include a list of videos that go over a lot of these topics, okay? And that way there, you can be better informed on material safety data sheets, on droplet precautions, you know, um, standard precautions. I'm gonna find videos on all that stuff, and I will post them in this video description so that you can study on your own, maybe in a little more detail than me reading from a book, right? Okay, guys. Well, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate you participating in this. And uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and write them down below. I'll stay tuned. And if I get any good ones tomorrow, 
We're gonna come back and we're gonna do some more flashcards. And this is a whole heap and stack of flashcards, all right? I have not looked at them, I have no clue what's in there. So we're gonna we're gonna take a look and see how much of the information we covered today is retained. And if it's retained, then good. This is a good format. If it wasn't retained, then we're gonna have to pull it up tomorrow and we're gonna have to go into some detail. So hope to see you tomorrow. Good luck on you guys and uh, independent study is a big thing.